Welcome, Susan. We're now officially on the market. Um, thanks, Deb. Oh, good, someone got that. Um, I'll just get my things sorted out here. Uh, thank you for noticing my title. Um, I, I guess it's good when, in, when you're at the end of the day to have an interesting title, but I didn't know when I wrote this title that I was going to have a pretty ex excellent adventure myself today. So I've come down from Sydney this morning. And um, yeah, well, I don't know whether you call sitting in a lounge and on a tarmac and on another tarmac an adventure, but it did take me a while to get here this morning. So glad to be here now. Um, okay, and I am sorry that I'm standing between you and drinks, but just remember that you're standing between me and drinks. <laughs> I desperately need a cup of tea. Okay, uh, all right, let's see if we can make this thing work. All right, I just want to pay my respects to the um, Wurundjeri people and uh, as the traditional custodians of the land to the elders past and present, uh, to my Indigenous colleagues here in the room today and um, a special hello to my brother who's here with me today. Uh, he actually works in the sector, he didn't just come to help. You know. uh, uh, okay, I'm sorry that I missed Aunty Julianne's um, welcome this morning, that was the plane's fault obviously, but uh, I'm sure it was terrific. All right, uh, okay, I want to start by saying today that, uh, that I'm really angry. I'm just going to put this down just a fraction lower. Maybe it's better if I can't see you. No, <laughs> um, I'm really angry today. I was reading this morning about a coronial inquest in Alice Springs into yet another questionable Aboriginal death in custody. The inquest, it's going to just go dark on me every now and again, the inquest has been considering the death from heart failure of a 39-year-old Aboriginal man with a serious hearing impairment who was known to communicate with sign language and in Pitjantjara, not very much in English. So just hold that in your head. He was in jail, just get that too. Uh, two nurses, the inquest heard, were convinced that this man had a sore throat not quite sure how they knew he had a sore throat, but there was a whole story about a kettle in the, in the piece that I was reading. I'll leave you to go find that out for yourself. But uh, Anyway, they were convinced that he had a sore throat and they sent him back to his accommodation. He's okay, don't worry. Where he subsequently died. Both the nurses were satisfied with the care that they had delivered, they told the inquest, despite not being able to do something as basic as communicate effectively with their patients. To make matters worse, a paramedic called to see the man, who, the collapsed man, he collapsed before he died, uh, administered the wrong dose of adrenaline. Adrenaline, you know, as you know, makes you a bit faster. You often give adrenaline uh, in cardiac arrest kinds of situations. I know that not because I watch too much TV, because I trained as a nurse in my other, li other life. Uh, okay, these kind of mistakes do happen, but it was what the expert medical witness said that really got me angry. A forensic pathologist at the inquest commented, pretty offhandedly to me, that the drug error was neither here nor there. Well, clearly not to him, but to the man and his family, possibly. It may not have made a difference. It's the language that made me angry. The coroner, just to make me a little bit more angry, concluded that this was, uh, there was little that could be done to have, uh, to, to have done better in this situation praised the prison health service for their thorough post-death review. Great that we are all doing reviews of our practice. Uh, I accept that remote area health is really complex. I actually, in that other life, have worked in Alice Springs at the base hospital there. I've also done other uh, remote area work. It is hard. However, while I don't all have all the answers, I do have to wonder, so I am coming back to what we're doing here, I do have to wonder what it says about the standards of our education system and the quality of our graduates when three different types of university graduates, presumably a lawyer in the corona, of the coroner, uh, a medical physician, and two nurses, I'm sorry to say, uh, when three different types of graduates can so lightly consider the death of an Aboriginal man. Sounds like systemic failure to me. So, I've got that off my chest now, thank you. Uh, let's move on. So, I want to just remind you before, this is perhaps a slightly boring bit, I want to just remind us before I go on to the uh, adventure, that 
uh, with, about the higher education standards framework and where Indigenous matters sit in the, in the framework. So universities are required, as you can see up there, to think about diversity and equity activities that they, that they do in their, in, their, in their universities. That's where the Indigenous matters sit in the framework. Uh, and you can see that, you can read that there, I don't necessarily need to read that out for you. But there has to be specific consideration given to Indigenous uh, matters in education. The idea, and it's a really good one, is to create equivalent opportunities for academic success, regardless of a student's background. We can't, who would want to deny that? that that's a great, that's, I don't actually have a problem with that. But what, what, my, what I and my Indigenous colleagues do tend to worry a little bit about is that as First Nations people, we don't necessarily want to be bundled up with a, bunch, a group of other diversity areas. We are the First Nations peoples, you know, sovereign custodians of land and the descendants of those uh, sovereign, sovereign custodians. So we get a little bit politicky about that. Don't worry, it, it's okay, but this is, this is what's exercising our minds. Okay, we think that what it might do, though, in this context is constrain both the ways that universities think about their activities and also the way TEXA considers um, and what they put their focus and attention on. Okay, so, so what I'm going to go on today now to talk to you about, I'm really hoping, oh yes, is the beginning of the adventure. And I just want to uh, go, go back to um, something that George said this morning in the diversity piece. He talked about diverse stories, and I guess I just want to remind us all that ours were the very first stories. And they we continue to have many stories. Okay. So, the journey begins. This woman will no doubt have much better health care today than her mother or her grandmother, or perhaps the women that came before her. This is because nurses and midwives, doctors, health practitioners, perhaps not that uh, forensic pathologist, um, get, they get uh, Indigenous focus in their, in their education and training. In fact, the Nurses and Midwives Association uh, just recently added um, a specific Indigenous clause to their code of conduct. So there is, there is great focus there in, um, in those, in the, um, in the training of, of health professionals these days. So, we can expect that this mother should get good care. Uh, when the M Nurses and Midwives Association actually made the tra change to their code of conduct though recently, and it, it's a really innocuous kind of phrase, uh, there was a big fuss in the media. You might have happened to cross it in, uh, you know, it was on, one of those commercial channel breakfast shows, there was a whole lot of stuff in the Twitterverse, there was a, there was a bit of a fuss. Are nurses suddenly now going to have to, or midwives, going to have to declare their white privilege before they can care for people? It went on and on like that. A little bit silly, really. Uh, and Janine Mohammed, the CEO of the National Congress of Aboriginal, nurses, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Nurses and Midwives, brought a calming sort of view to the, to the picture when she said, really, we are simply asking that there is holistic care then it's free of bias and racism. Surely not too much to ask as a benchmark in our healthcare uh, today. What it does tell us though is that this baby is going to come into a world where racism continues to be an issue. One of the first places this child will come, uh, come up against that is possibly, not probably and not absolutely, but possibly in the school system. We know that teachers, particularly early, early career teachers, uh, despite there being mandated Indigenous curriculum in that they have to teach to s children and also that they learn in their undergraduate programs, despite that, our, early our um, initial teacher education graduates are least comfortable teaching Indigenous curriculum and Indigenous students. So, they have a, you know, a problematic issue for our poor child already. Uh, and you add to that the weight of low expectations. And when people say that Indigenous students may well have faced a number of hurdles before they get into, inst be before they get into universities, this is perhaps the more nitty gritty of what it means. All right, so our journey has begun. I'm gonna digress though. 
it's a bit like me. I want to just give a little plug for our Indigenous higher education centres. Um, you could call me a bit of an apologist for, for our Indigenous centres, but I think we have something, almost 20,000 Indigenous students uh, studying in universities these days. Uh, that's, not, that's numbers, not EFSL. Um, at all levels. Those students, I don't think, would be here today in those numbers without the really critical work of the Indigenous higher education centres. Sometimes they're troubled, not everybody believes in them. However, over the last 30 years, they have really done great work in this, in, in this area. 30 years ago, the National Abor Aboriginal Education Committee petitioned the government for support centres in our institutions to buttress their 100 Indigenous Teachers Initiative. They were wanting to boost the numbers of Indigenous teachers 30 years ago. They knew, though, that bringing students, bringing Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people into universities would be problematic. The few people who were in universities at that time often found the situation isolating, alienating. Those are two really common words that recur in the literature. So, the centres began. All of your universities now will have a centre, an Indigenous centre of some kind. Sometimes they're support centres only, mostly these days they do a range of other things. And then there are other centres like the one that I work in, which do, which are, are not support centres at all, um, and do a, a range of other jobs, which I might tell you something about in a moment. Okay, so despite the myriad challenges of these centres, they have been the engine rooms, I think, of Indigenous success in higher education. They've nurtured our student growth, They've driven institutional reform. Oh, truly, we have driven institutional reform. And they're producing the leaders of the future. Thank you for drawing our attention to those, Sadie. <laughs> it's great. All right. And often with limited resources, uh, sometimes in hostile environments, and, yeah, and in hostile environments, yep. Many of our current leaders, some of those 24 PVCs that we have, in uh, Indigenous PVCs that we have across universities, congratulations to those institutions. Um, many of those have worked in the Indigenous centres. All right, let's go back to our journey, I hope. Yes. So, access is the, is the beginning. I, I, don't want to, um, I don't want to necessarily tell you all of the things that happen in my university, although, of course, it is a fantastic university. Uh, and we do really, really great work. Did I say we have 13 Indigenous professors? Probably not, and there's no need at this slide, but, um, so, <laughs> okay, I'm able to just throw my notes out now. Um, so, all universities have, uh, quite sophisticated these days, access programs, drawing into schools, mostly at high school level, sometimes almost into primary school these days. I suspect that's where we need to be. But, you know, kids from, kids, Indigenous kids in schools have quite a lot of choice these days, if they stay in school. And that's another whole problem that we can't talk about right now. Uh, you know, there's summer camps, there's winter camps, there's, uh, you know, immersive experiences, students are doing bandaging, making, you know, making volcanoes, they're doing all sorts of things that you might, uh, you might do and find interesting in a university. In our university, uh, I know uh, some kids come in and do, uh, in our design faculty, they make animations. How cool is that? I hate to tell them that that's not what they're probably going to be doing all of their career, but or all of their university time. But, you know, it's, it's, you know it draws, it, it makes kids excited. All of our institutions are doing quite complex work in this space. Okay. Oh, I, I will say, so complex, there's fierce competition at the moment. So we're, you know, we're all working to get our Indigenous student numbers up. But there's also co collaboration. So for example, here in Victoria, we have the Turong Manong, or you have, the Turong Manong Higher Education Accord that was brokered in 2009. Uh, in New South Wales, there's the Bridges to Higher Education, uh, a group of, in these cases, groups of universities get together to work on not competing about student numbers, but how to raise aspirations and doing work in schools to, to just uh, have students know about uh, coming to university. The competition card starts later. Okay. Participation and retention. I, mean, I probably could have done a whole presentation on this, so 
uh, I am going to just draw your attention to a couple of things here. Uh, Indigenous students will often, not always, uh, will often be the only Indigenous student in their university classroom. Sometimes they might be one or two, you know, if we're lucky there's a critical mass in, in some degrees, maybe in education, maybe in nursing. Uh, if the students are in an Indigenous identified block mode program, they may well, they're, they're, they're unlikely to be, but in most cases they will be, they will often be the only student in their classroom. Now, it's not for me to say what that means, but very recently I was at a first year experience forum in my own institution and I heard I was, there was a student panel and one of our Indigenous students said, I worry, I get nervous every time I go to class because I don't know what will happen. I don't know who will ask me a question about Aboriginal things that I don't know the answer to. I don't know who will say something racist or that I'm uncomfortable with. So, you know, that's the, that's the kind of experience that some, not all, Indigenous students might have in our classroom. So, in terms of thinking about participation, it isn't just about, well, it is partly about having our, our practices and our approaches to learning and teaching that are designed to, to accommodate Indigenous students. It is really thinking about, in that very personalised way, Nick, about our Indigenous students. I, I've underlined accommodate because I don't really like that word. I, I'm sure if you were asked me to put another word in there, I wouldn't know what to put, but, but it, we don't want to be accommodated. We don't want our students to be accommodated. What we want them to have is a really exciting experience. We want them to learn and, and to grow and develop into the leaders of the future. Okay. The other thing to say on this point, I guess, is that my experience and my work at the moment is leading an Indigenous graduate attribute project at UTS across the whole university. So I talk to lots of academics. Many of them, they're really great people. They're really fearful often about how they will do Indigenous curriculum and often they don't know very much about Indigenous students. So, so there's a, quite a significant piece of work there I think that the sector needs to do. Uh, okay. Look, I won't say very much about retention. Retention is a really significant, significant issue. It's one of the things that TEXA monitors, uh, and I don't know what the kind of interplay m there might be, but if we're monitoring it, we're certainly not doing an awful lot about accountability, I would suggest. Okay, graduation and success. This can go really quickly because actually lots of universities are doing, you know, interesting things themselves around internships, uh, international experiences, the new Colombo plan's been helpful, um, uh, work integrated learning, so Indigenous students are getting brought along with those, with, in those kinds of things. Also work here, quite complicated work done with external partners. So for example, career trackers, some of your institutions will no doubt, um, University of Canberra in fact, has a 10 year agreement as do we at UTS with career trackers to have um, Indigenous students placed in internships, summer and winter internships. They are, um, from my experience, terrific. I have a son doing one right at the moment. Um, uh, the Aurora Initiative, they're doing internships, they're doing, they're doing uh, overseas travel kinds of um, uh, experiences for Indigenous students. So there's a, a fair bit of third party work going on here, I guess, is the point I want to make at this point. And the final point to make is that Indigenous students, uh, this is the really bright piece of news, is that an Indigenous student with a degree is very, very likely to get a job probably more likely than, than non-Indigenous um, colleagues, in fact. So, you know, that's really good news. That may partly be because uh, they've already got jobs when they come to university because the cohort is skewed towards being older. Okay. Uh, I'm going to go through this fairly quickly because this one's really boring and drinks are beckoning. So, but there is, I will just say that there's been quite a lot of work in this higher education space. Berendt said that, we, that universities needed research strategies. Uh, the ACOLA review made some really good suggestions, increasing the weighting for Indigenous higher degree research students. I don't think any of us have really come to qu quite to grips with that at the moment. Um, flexibility in scholarships, increasingly universities are offering significant top-up scholarships. I know we are at UTS, uh, one of the Queensland universities certainly is. There'll be competition, fierce competition in this space too, I think. Uh, okay, and then, oh, and the Universities Australia strategy, which of course you all completely across, I know, 
Um, it says that all universities should have research strategies in place by 2018. Okay. So I just want to come back to the higher education standards framework and return to that point that I was making about us being in the, in the sort of diversity area. This is what the, the framework um, looks like, what the, the, the model. It's really good. It's, I mean, what a great way to frame things. I think there's just one little thing we might add. And it might look like this. So that actually our Indigenous activities, our student in Indigenous participation, cuts across all of these areas. Okay, I have a couple more final things that I want to say about um, about Indigenous, uh, well, the Indigenous Academy and the relationship with TEXA. Um, the National Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Higher Education Consortium, it's a long one, Natsi Heck has just signed an MOU with TEXA. Uh, we're expecting to be working on lots of ideas here, but perhaps on some capacity building around the, um, the panel of experts, ensuring that there are more Indigenous experts. That should help to build our capacity, but also I suspect that there's some capacity building being will need to be done within TEXA. Where are the Indigenous people in TEXA? I sometimes this is the hard question just before drinks, but well, I mean, where are the Indigenous people? What what do the, the current Texas staff know about Indigenous education? You know, I think there's great work that we can do there and um, I, I think uh, we and Texas are really excited about that. Uh, and that would seem to me to be a win-win situation. And that's it, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Susan. Questions from the audience? Wow, we have already questions for you in the app. Oh, I said there'd be no questions. <laughs> uh, given an Anglo-centric tradition, what impact does that have on a culturally appropriate delivery model that is respectful, sensitive, and provides a safe space for engagement? Okay. It's just a small question. And we do want drinks today. Can I underline bits of it? That you <laughs> yes, here's a pen. I think the question is really asking, unless the person who typed the question would like to um, own it, but I think the question is asking, given that universities come from an Anglo-centric tradition in this country anyway, obviously they come from many traditions, but... I'm going to give two answers to it. Yep. I'll stand over here because I'm, you know, I'm both short and perhaps a little quiet. Um, just wait till after drinks. Um, Do you grow? <laughs> <laughs> I wish. No, not at all. Um, so I'm going to answer that in two ways. I think I think having culturally appropriate delivery of curriculum ha has got to be good for Indigenous students. You know, we would really like... It would be great for that student who spoke about being anxious going to class not to be anxious going to class. It would be great if our Indigenous students could go into their classes and feel confident that they can identify if they want or not if they don't, uh, not have to tell their stories over and over again. Uh, a piece of research that I'm doing at the moment with, with students studying Indigenous studies, uh, one of the Indigenous... Uh, participants in that research talked about, you know, fatigue of, of telling his story uh, over and over and having to teach his classmates. So, so that's one thing. The other thing I think is maybe what this might be asking is around that idea of having indigenized curriculum. And forgive me if I'm wrong because this is perhaps me just saying what I want to say. Um, indigenized curriculum, which we are all working towards, the Universities of Australia strategy commits all institutions to that. Um, the indigenized curriculum is not just good for indigenous students. It is, and the, the literature will back me up on this, it is great for surprise, those things like soft skills, great for students, criticality, their metacognition. So all students doing indigenised curriculum are likely to benefit. I don't know whether that answered the question. But I think there's a, another sub-question there which is around multimodal knowledge, right? So, you know, Anglo-Celtic traditions or Anglo-centric Anglo traditions are very text-based often um, and in the case of traditional university courses they might also be verbal. But what about other ways in which we can transfer knowledge and grow knowledge and produce discovery? Because I think that's where there's some really interesting challenges for curriculum development. Oh, boy, I wish I had the answer to that. Um, <laughs> uh, 
you know, I think some of the things that people are doing in institutions at the moment in terms of, you know, being a little bit interesting is, is learning on country. So there are a bunch of uh, people both in the human geographies, education, in a range of disciplines, doing work on learning on country. So that's not just for Indigenous students, but it is for all students. Um, Neil Harrison from Macquarie University, for example, does this lovely work where his education students actually learn on country in the university grounds with Darug people. How cool is that? You know, we don't have to go away to be on country. We are, we are on country always. Um, I think that's a really interesting. Is that the point. answer? Yeah. yeah. No, was that the question? Well, I mean, even thinking at UTS Jambana has like an indigenous garden, which they yes, they kind yeah, of yeah. have developed as a way of trying to think differently about yeah, yeah, what yeah. constitutes knowledge in a university environment. Yeah, yeah. No, we do. We have a great garden. Um, cultural sensitisation towards indigenous culture is important and should be taught in every Australian institute in some way. What is being done in this regard? Oh well. Um, what, well, so first, I mean, the first thing to say is that Universities of Australia has committed to exactly that. Now, how is that being done? It's being done in various ways across various institutions. Some institutions uh, have quite well developed. I think La Trobe and UWA, for example, have nice modules that students do. You know, all students have to do. They're hurdle kinds of modules. Um, there's a range of things. I'll, I'll tell you what we're doing, just because, well, that's what I know best, probably. Um, at, at UTS, we take a graduate attribute approach to this. Uh, the centre that I work in, with three academics, are tasked largely with rolling that out across the university. Uh, we are working hard with our disciplines and our faculties to, to develop curriculum. First thing we've done is to get people to write their course intended learning outcomes. So we're working with, with the academics to do that. Do I have all the answers? Probably not. We've just published a paper in higher education, uh, Paige Trudgett and Bodkin Andrews, if you're interested, and an earlier paper in, uh, I heard it's a conference paper around critical race theory, which talks about the kinds of climate, cultural climate that you might need uh, uh, for that. So there's a, there's a suite of papers that will be out, but there's two out at the moment that might be useful for you. There's a question from the floor. Terrible plug for myself, isn't it? Yes, sorry. <laughs> um, Sadie. Hi, Sadie. Um, so I entered university, I was looking at slides, and I entered a university as a non-traditional student. I dropped out of school at year 10. I really struggled when I started. I went through an enabling program. Um, and now I teach an enabling program, um, and which is I absolutely love, and I love my students. Um, but I worry put allowing my students to go into undergrad that they're going into an environment that I may have been in as an undergrad, um, and that you feel unsafe walking into campus. And you were mentioning um, the centres, which are incredibly important, but some institutions are closing those down. So what are some of the things that you really feel are key indicators of keeping our students at university um, and graduating that maybe us in the sector could implement or ma strive to maintain? Okay, well, that's a really big question. So if we think back to... So, so I think the centres are really important. Yes, some universities are closing their centres down, I would argue that that's probably, uh, it's probably not the right thing to do, but obviously institutions will do what, what they will do, and there, there are sometimes good reasons for those, uh, sometimes maybe not. Um, so, so the centres are a part of it. If we look back to the Berendt Review, one of the very clear recommendations of Larissa Berendt and her team's review was that we take a whole of university approach. And so part of what we're seeing in the sector at the moment, the, the flow on to the strategy, is this whole of sector approach. So Indigenous business is actually everyone's business. Those senior positions are, are helping to drive some of that. Now, will that be the absolute answer? Probably not. I, I do think there is still quite a significant piece of work that needs to be done around, around supporting staff to know what, to, I mean, all staff to know what they can do for Indigenous students. Sometimes it's not very much at all. Sometimes it's the same thing. I mean, some, another, another piece of research that I did a few years ago would suggest that Indigenous students are highly engaged at university. It's just there are some things that we don't have a lot of control over, 
to some extent that, that, that get in the way. Finances, if any of you have read the, uh, the most recent student finances report, Indigenous students are you know, worst off overall. I mean, there's no competition, but Indigenous students, for, for your Indigenous students, finance is a really key issue. That's why those scholarships are so important. Housing, those kinds of things. Health, health is another thing we can do fairly little about, although we might, in this era of personalised, you know, student approaches, we might have, uh, not different, but we might have broader, more flexible approaches to things like extensions. Some of my colleagues will howl me down on that, but um, I'm the extension queen, don't, don't tell everyone that, but, you know, I, I take my, I, my students case by case, my non-Indigenous students case by case, and maybe we, there's more flexibility there that could work. I think it's never one thing. It's all of us working in tandem. Yeah. Oh, one final thing, teacher accreditation. I know that there is talk about teacher accreditation at the moment. I think we would be foolhardy to go into a teacher accreditation process that doesn't take into account teaching Indigenous students and Indigenous curriculum. Are you asking for an extension? Because I'm not going to give you one. No. So, um, thanks so much to Susan for a wonderful last session for today.